What is the difference between telling and showing something? Assuming they are both attempting to deliver the same message, how do they both differ in execution? The public discourse lately seems to be one chaotic mess, with genuine communication seeming like a pipe dream. What effect does this have in our connection to one another? And what does this mean for the words we use? I realize this is not exactly the usual topic matter I discuss, but I decided to take the path of perpetual torment. So, with that being said, let's get started. What is a way to really resonate with people? To evoke feelings of shared emotions? Perhaps it can be done with engaging in direct conversation, expressing yourself with words. Despite this, complex information can also travel in other ways. The game series Dark Souls is an excellent example of this, in which a story is not told directly to the player, but rather expressed via a myriad of different mediums, whether that be atmosphere, environment, item descriptions, etc. This indirect way of storytelling really resonates with many, that despite this format, countless others have pieced together a tale from the fragments told in the Soul series, not only promoting critical thinking in the process, but perhaps the complex emotions of Dark Souls really resonates with people that enjoy it, which may have not been possible if its story were told more directly. So where am I going at with this? What is the difference between telling and showing something? To answer that, we head to May of 2020, in which Joe Rogan had Elon Musk on his podcast. They discussed unique subjects ranging from artificial intelligence to the global pandemic. However, one unique topic stood out. Let's say you've got some complex idea that you're trying to convey to somebody else. And how, how do you do that? Well, your, your brain spends a lot of effort compressing a complex concept into words and there's a there's a lot of a lot of loss information loss that occurs when compressing a complex concept into words and then you say those words those words are then interpreted then they're decompressed by the person who is listening um, and they they will at best get a, a, a very incomplete understanding of what you're trying to convey it's very difficult to convey a complex concept with precision um, because you've got compression decompression, you may not even have heard all the words correctly, and so communication is difficult. You know, what we have here is a failure to communicate. Perhaps what Elon Musk describes here is a phenomenon that occurs more often than we would think. That a communication asymmetry develops between the ideas we hold and the words we convey. To begin this analysis, let's discuss media. Earlier on, I gave a question referencing a common mantra found within media studies. Show, don't tell. What do those words mean exactly? And why has this phrase gained esteem? Well, to quote Jerry Jenkins' article regarding this, When you tell rather than show, you simply inform your reader of information, rather than allowing him to deduce anything alluding that the viewer in question may gain a better understanding of a subject without the need for words. To bring examples of this in practice, we go to film, in which the performance and framing of scenes can often express themselves more intimately, without need for dialogue. Which arrives us to Canadian philosopher and professor Marshall McLuhan, author of the book The Medium is the Message detailing how the way we send and receive information should also be subject to analysis, rather than just the information itself. For instance, mediums such as the book, television, film, and so on, each deliver a unique perception of the world around us. Therefore, they should also be subject to analysis. And with the inception of these mediums, so too does our comprehension. For example, the Gutenberg printing press played a key role in the proliferation of books and literature, in addition to having a function with the Protestant Reformation. Likewise, in the 20th century, television made its mark, 
carving a new way to frame and visualize events, giving birth to the modern news apparatus as we know it, whether it be in political, economic, or social spheres. In contemporary times, the rise of the internet has played a similar role in the public discourse, this time providing a much more individualized experience. Whether it be on forums, video sharing, or social media, this too has influenced the way we communicate. However, each medium we have discussed is rooted fundamentally in one aspect. Words. According to the Oxford English Dictionary, thousands of words are added every year, which reveals a curiosity regarding words themselves. That language is not so much static but rather dynamic. With the changing of the times, so too does its practice, resulting in commonly used words taking on completely different meanings in the past, which raises a question on how the words we use today will be uttered in the future. As stated by philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein, believing that language can perfectly capture reality is a kind of bewitchment. Not to say it's not possible, but this underlying doctrine is further explained by his works, that Wittgenstein was under the belief that philosophical problems arose from misunderstandings of the logic of language. Not to say objectivity is absent, but rather language itself holds a performative element. For example, when someone attempts to reflect reality through their own words, they have a decision to make. For a moment, they decide what the world is to them through whatever bias, filter, or narrative they hold. The ability to interpret reality through your own words is tempting or bewitching. Will they always speak as objectively as possible? Are there subconscious biases? Are they looking for specific concepts to fit into a chronicle? Did they even look at reality properly? What is their method of accomplishing even that? Etc. As said by Wittgenstein himself, Philosophy is a battle against the bewitchment of our intelligence by means of language. For an example of this in practice, we head to a website well known for well-reasoned discussion and debate, Twitter. Of course, I'm kidding. But let's look at a conversation found on the site. For the sake of fairness, participants involved will remain anonymous. Plus, this example was previously used over in Moist Critical's channel discussing Twitter. Context for it revolves around Martin Scorsese's statement on Marvel films, likening them to theme parks, which resulted in user 1 stating, I think it's deeply ironic that Scorsese thinks Marvel films are the same movies over and over, when in fact this guy really only makes one movie, let's be honest. Some of them are truly fantastic, don't get me wrong, but come on. This prompted a reply from user 2 expressing that. He's made like 4-5 to five mob films, but how are Age of Innocence, Hugo, Kundun, Last Temptation of Christ, After Hours, King of Comedy, silence the same movies? Cueing the former user to state. Yeah, sorry, I'm not engaging with disingenuous fanboys who just want to fight. Bye. This response seems a bit defensive. Instead of a discussion, there is deflection. But why is that? While it may be possible that the words used in this conversation were understood differently between the users. Earlier on in this video, I referenced Joe Rogan's podcast with Elon Musk, in which he discussed communication asymmetry, that the ideas we hold and the words that represent them may not be precisely articulated to others. In short, it may be possible, however unlikely, that when user 1 read user 2's reply, he understood those words as an attack or an affront, whereas that might have not been user 2's intent, creating a situation in which meaning is lost for some, while meaning is gained for others. This creates an imbalance, which leads to an inevitability of debates or lack of resulting both to reconcile what meaning is. This is made even more evident when looking at the context behind the exchange in the first place, in which user 1 interpreted Scorsese's Marvel statement as a pejorative, whereas when you look at the actual interview itself, a different comment is seen. Yeah, but I think we're redefining it now in, in such a way, uh, I think it's uh, not just an evolving of cinema, but it's a revolution 
Uh, I mean, it's as even bigger than the revolution that sound brought to cinema. Uh, it's the revolution of cinema itself. It's something that, that should always be protected as much as possible, and I think will always be there, is a communal experience. And I think that's best in a theater. Now, homes are becoming theaters too. <laughs> but it, it, it's, it's a major change. Um, and I think uh, one has to keep an open mind what streaming means and how that's going to define a new form of cinema, I'm not sure. I thought for a while maybe long-form TV is cinema. It's not. It simply isn't. You know, it's, it's a different viewing experience. You could look at three episodes, two, four, ten, you know, one, one week, a second episode, the second week. That's not. Um, but there's room for so many others now and so many other ways. And there's going to be crossovers completely. Um, the value... How do you, I don't know, say the value of a film that's like a uh, theme park film, for example, uh, in a Marvel type pictures, where, where the theaters become amusement parks. That's a different experience. And it's like, it's not even, it's a, I was saying earlier, it's not cinema, it's something else. You know, whether you go for that or not, but it is something else and they shouldn't be, we shouldn't be invaded by it. Um, and so that, that's a big issue. That's a big issue. Uh, and we need the theater owners to step up for that, you see to allow theaters to show films that are narrative films. A narrative film could be one long take for three hours, too, you know. To analyze Scorsese's own position, in which during the interview he discussed the revolution of film, with his own background being more of a traditionalist, he is understanding series and cinematic universes as new mediums, not necessarily in a derogatory manner, as stated in a follow-up about the situation. Some people seem to have seized on the last part of my answer as insulting, or as evidence of hatred for Marvel on my part. If anyone is intent on characterizing my words on that light, there is nothing I can do to stand in the way. The unbalance of interpretation really shows in this example, opening a discourse in which a few words were previously insufficient. Twitter is notorious for this kind of trend, in which users have just a few words to express themselves. Which brings up another question. To whoever's listening in, can you recall a situation where you have said something that was misinterpreted by another? As a result, more words had to be uttered to close the distance of meaning. Saying a few words indeed has power. The lack of it tends for the mind to run amok with possibility. Doubly so when firms both big and small have an incentive to create sensational titles that may overstate the reality at hand. Most viewers only really read the titles or tweets of articles and may or may not jump to conclusions. I use this Naruto example because of how vanilla and neutral it is. Or at least I think it's neutral. As a result, the issue of interpretation and performance when it comes to words may be heightened. Combined with Twitter's emphasis on likes and engagements, this has led towards an insistence of posturing for contemporary virtues. In short, saying words that elicit some form of moral excellence or merit. This trend has persisted in contemporary times with the conflation of words and action, resulting in perceived contemptible words to be amounted as such. On the flip side, this has also allowed for perceived virtuous words to also be associated with action. Which raises a question, does saying virtuous words make one virtuous? Or better yet, what is virtue? Well, in the book Nicomachean Ethics, Aristotle states, Excellence is an art won by training and habituation. We do not act rightly because we have virtue or excellence. But we rather have those because we have acted rightly. We are what we repeatedly do. Excellence, then, is not an act, but a habit. In short, obtaining virtue is not a quick and easy act. Performing just one virtuous task does not necessarily make one virtuous, but rather a habit performed. Merriam-Webster defines virtue as a particular moral excellence. Humans are complicated. Of course, speaking in generalities, not absolutes. Can a singular act really define us? Or rather, what an individual has accumulated in its habits? So much of human behavior is based on habits. In fact, psychology has covered the topic extensively. Whether it is to do well in class, exercise, competition, productivity, etc. So why say virtuous words instead of performing virtuous actions? Unfortunately, unlike us, words have an aura of permanence. 
As a result, it's easier to say virtuous words as opposed to acting on them, since there is a difference in commitment. As stated by Aristotle, excellence is not a gift, but a skill that takes practice. We do not act rightly because we are excellent. In fact, we achieve excellence by acting rightly. In short, there is a difference in earnestness between saying and acting, with one requiring more dedication than the other. It's easier to say you will accomplish something rather than actually committing to it. Of course, I am speaking in generalities, not absolutes here. In specific cases, words indeed follow actions. For a more in-depth analysis on that front, I would recommend checking out my censorship video. Moving on, more often than not, memories are subject to our experience and comprehension. They act as a record, and often these memories are then translated into words. And as stated previously, there may be limitations to this framework. What I mean by that is, how can you accurately express to someone complex emotions? Can someone truly and deeply understand your life's history by words alone? Which brings up another question. How do you exchange ideas without words? Music and sound direction both have a unique way of expressing themselves. Depending on how either is performed, unique emotions can be conveyed. Whether it be a sense of serene yet comforting isolation, to destructive yet motivational pieces. Music is capable of delivering complex emotions, as stated by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. Music is the universal language. Even when listening to songs from a language we do not understand, we can always be subject to its theme and emotion. So why bring this all up? Well, communication is a complex topic, which is not purely a lingual art. Commonly posture, facial expression, tone of voice, etc. all play a role. And within a world increasingly dominated by the internet, words by themselves are thus more emphasized. Doubly so when entities may take advantage of this for ulterior motives, in which following the establishment of the People's Republic of China in 1949, party official Li Xinquan had this to say. In future conflicts, it is possible to conduct social psychological operations by making use of advanced technology and mass media, which means to create and spread various misinformation through news media and computer communication networks in order to generate confusion and chaos in the enemy country, affect public mentality and disrupt their intelligence, decision-making and policy implementation. With this in mind, Will words be seized upon by state actors to influence the public discourse? I'll leave that to your discretion. To make a comparison to antiquity, within ancient Greece, language itself had status, with deliberation and voting manifesting by way of voice. Speakers and writers alike could influence public debate. Of course, we certainly live in unique times, with so much information at our disposal via the internet or by other circumstances. Anxiety may arise, defined as the body's natural response to stress, of fear or apprehension about what may come. With so many thoughts developing at once, it often feels suffocating, crushed under the weights of your own mind. Unpacking all of that information is incredibly daunting as a result. So to answer our previous question, how can you accurately express complex emotions to another? Well, we head to an underrated show on Netflix, The Dragon Prince, a story about two brothers striving to reconcile a divided world. In one scene, the older brother Calum goes through an episode as a result of a complicated past. To console him, his mother appears, who then states, <gasps> Callum, you need to breathe. You just need to breathe, sweetie. I feel so overwhelmed with everything. I, I have so many thoughts, things racing through my head. Sometimes you just need to focus on the present. Take a deep breath and just be. 
Sometimes things can get so complicated that our minds can't quite sort them out alone. But when you slow down and let yourself breathe, your spirit and your body can catch up with your mind and help out. I just have to breathe? To know something truly and deeply, you must know it with your head, hand, and heart, mind, body, and spirit. I love you with all of myself, and I always will. To know something truly and deeply, understanding it beyond words becomes a given. There is a reason why Shodown Tal is so effective. On the subject of creation, people often express themselves through art to convey complex emotions. Whether it be a great loss, deep affection, a fall of faith, and so on. Indeed, unpacking complex information is daunting. Perhaps it's because all that complexity pierces into our very identity. As a result, opening up is analogous to showing someone else who you really are. And that can be scary. For an example of this material, here is a scene found in the 1997 film Good Will Hunting, in which Robin Williams' character Dr. Sean attempts to reason with Matt Damon's character Will. You know what occurred to me? No. You're just a kid. You don't have the faintest idea of what you're talking about. Why, thank you. It's all right. You've never been out of Boston. Nope. So if I asked you about art, you'd probably give me the skinny on every art book ever written. Michelangelo. You know a lot about him. Life's work, political aspirations, him and the Pope, sexual orientation, the whole works, right? I bet you can't tell me what it smells like in the Sistine Chapel. You never actually stood there and looked up at that beautiful ceiling. You're a tough kid. When I ask you about war, you'd probably uh, throw Shakespeare at me, right? Once more into the breach, dear friends. But you've never been near one. You've never held your best friend's head in your lap and watch him gasp his last breath looking to you for help. But you're a genius, Will. No one denies that. No one could possibly understand the depths of you. But you presume to know everything about me because you saw a painting of mine. You ripped my fucking life apart. You're an orphan, right? Do you think I'd know the first thing about how hard your life has been? How you feel? Who you are? Because I read Oliver Twist. Does that encapsulate you? Personally, I don't give a shit about all that because you know what? I can't learn anything from you. I can't read in some fucking book. Unless you want to talk about you. Who you are. Believing that language can perfectly capture reality is a kind of bewitchment. This video is not intended to say we should not use words at all or that we should just communicate with music or other forms of art. But to note that the very process of communication has its difficulties. To understand words as a medium in a vast array of other intermediaries. To know its strengths, its shortcomings, and its relationship within the human dynamic. After all, there is purpose in compressing data when communicating. Oftentimes, we don't have the energy or time to research and verify every last piece of information that comes our way. Nonetheless, understanding this shortcoming can be an advantage in itself. To develop an economy of information to best determine what meaning is. After all, we can only plan out a strategy when we first know our limitations. Oftentimes, we do not only communicate to understand others, but also to better understand ourselves. Therefore, if communication is hindered, perhaps how we see ourselves and how others view us becomes distant. Of course, even if we articulate ourselves accurately, there is a possibility that we are proven mistaken nonetheless. There is nothing wrong with this. It's only natural, axiomatic. And the words of Socrates, it is better to change an opinion than to persist in a wrong one.
Perhaps we get defensive when we are proven wrong because it displays our fallibility. That perception clashes between how others view us and how we view ourselves. That for those who accept intelligence as a part of one's own identity, it's troublesome to think that we may not be who we think we are. And accepting that new reality may be damaging to one's own identity. However, in the end, we are what we repeatedly do. Across the public discourse and all its imaginings, if I could put into words the purpose of this video, I would ask to also analyze the method of how you receive information, in addition to the information itself. How is it compressed, decompressed, and interpreted? Oftentimes, the same words may be understood differently between those who communicate, in addition to the fact that a few words may not be sufficient to accurately judge the sum of a character. I can understand this is an odd upload considering recent work. I just wanted to make this since this was on my mind lately. Plus, I've been playing some Dark Souls, so there's that. But this doesn't mean I will stop doing the kind of videos I'm more known for. In fact, the new Doom Eternal DLC got me really interested. I also want to apologize again for the lack of uploads. It really feels like I've been saying that every vid lately. All I can say is that I am hard at work with the next batch of content and can't wait to share them with you all. But at any event, special thanks goes to all of our Patreon supporters. I can't stress how unbelievably grateful I am to you guys. Even when I haven't been uploading as much as I should, you guys are still there. I really want to make it up to you, so expect some good stuff coming your way. If you want to see Night Owl continue on, donating as little as $1 over in Patreon will honestly go a long way. If not, liking and commenting also helps a great deal. Regardless of what happens though, have a wonderful rest of the day or night, and have a damn good one. Thank you.